So good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the first lecture in our IBC Commerce keynote speaker series for 2021 and 2022. So this is a new experiment for us. Um, we used to do them just live and just have a live audience for them. And then um, starting last um, March, we moved them online completely. So we only had online sessions. What we have now is our first hybrid session. So we have um, over 100 people joining us online already, plus the people in the room. So um, if the technology goes wrong, we apologize in advance. We're, we're trying our best. This is, a, this is a new experience for us and for the un university in this, in this kind of event. Um, so welcome to the first um, um, talk. I'm George Clark, the director of the Center for the um, Study of Western Hemispheric Trade in TAMIU's A.R. Sanchez School of Business. Our center, together with IBC Bank and Commerce Bank, um, brings speakers to talk about um, topics in areas of international trade, international economics, finance, demography, and immigration. And um, before in, um, introducing today's speaker, I want to thank our sponsors for supporting the event, IBC Bank and Commerce Bank. So if we can give them a, a round of applause um, And you can uh, you can do that, and if you're watching online, you can do this in your in your house as well, if you want. Um, with their support, we've been able to bring many thought-provoking speakers throughout the years to Tammy U and Laredo. Before I introduce the speaker, I want to talk a little bit about the housekeeping. Um, at the end of the presentation, there's going to be a question and answer session. So, if you're in the audience, what you need to do is you need to stick up your hand, and one of our worker, student workers will bring you a microphone, and you'll be able to ask the um, speaker questions in ways that both the people in the room can hear you and the people online can hear you. Um, for people who are not in attendance, for people who are watching online, what you can do is you can type your questions into the Q&A box and then um, I will read them out to the speakers and we'll do as many as we possibly can throughout the talk. So um, as many as the lot of time will allow. Um, for students attending in person on behalf of one of your classes, um, you, should have, you should have scanned your student ID when you came in. And in addition, you were provided with a QR code. And what you need to do is you need to take that QR code and to go to the, use it to go to the website. And there, there'll be an online form where you will submit your class information. Um, finally, you need to scan your ID as you leave as well so that we know when you came in and when you left. So that's for the students here. If you're attending online, your class information should have been submitted when you registered on, on online. And all this information is provided to your professors. Um, so once again, thank you for joining us. Today's speaker is Roya Hakakian. Ms. Hakakian is an author, a journalist, a filmmaker, and a poet. So she's uh, um, multi-talented. Um, she's also a founding member of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, and she serves on the board of Refugees International. Um, she's recently completed a film commissioned by UNICEF um, armed and Innocent on the involvement of underage children in wars around the world. And the film is narrated by Robert De Niro. Um, she's also written many books and um, that have appeared on bestseller lists. Her latest book, A Beginner's Guide to America for the Immigrant and the Curious, was released in March 2021. And if you're here, it's on sale um, outside the, 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 the lecture. And if you're not here, it's, it's on sale at the Tammy U Bookstore. So let's welcome Ms. Hakakian to Tammy Yu and to Laredo. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm double vaccinated, so I took off. Um, I wanted to, I was explaining to uh, some of our hosts this evening, uh, this afternoon, that um, I never knew how much I loved being among people. I thought I only wrote because I love writing. Um, and then they sent me on book tours and I realized that I love meeting people almost as much as I love writing. So COVID has been a difficult experience for me because I released a brand new book and I've been meeting the audiences on Zoom, which is not nearly as enjoyable as uh, being among them. So when Amy, um who was just here and left and i wanted to thank her for organizing all of this wrote me saying would you be willing to come to laredo i said yes 
Um, so this is my, you know, after having uh, released this uh, most recent book about four months ago, five months ago, this is my very first in-person event, and I'm delighted. So I'm going to give you a round of applause. Um, can you hear me well? I don't like standing in front of podiums, but uh, during the Q&As, I will be down there and hope uh, the conversation will be more lively. So um, in 2016, um, I, who have been a naturalized uh, citizen, U.S. citizen for nearly 30 years, um, found myself staring into the television, feeling uh, quite shaken up. Um, and and it, was a, it was an irrational reaction on my part because I have been a naturalized citizen for so many years. Uh, but the more I listened to, to the political rhetoric that we were all hearing in 2016, um, I realized that there are certain feelings that uh, these conversations, these um, you know, uh, debates about immigrants and immigration was staring in me that I didn't even know uh, existed. So suddenly, um, you know, as, as I was introduced before, um, I have been a, a journalist, I have uh, worked as a reporter, I have uh, published books, I have made films. Um, so when I thought about my own identity, the last thing I thought would occur to me was that I'm also a refugee and an immigrant. But lo and behold, um, when I heard uh, certain things, and I will tell you what they were, um, I realized that, you know, there there is somehow uh, an immigrant trapped in me still after all these years, and there is uh, a, a very large uh, portion of that refugee experience that's within me and still defines me. Um, so some of the things that, that um, you may remember, um, the very first thing was, there will be a ban on people from Muslim nations. And I was born and raised in Iran. Um, you know, perhaps uh, I should mention that Iran is right next to Afghanistan. So watching uh, the footage coming from Afghanistan, watching the news of Afghanistan in the last few months has not been easy for me because it, in many ways it reminds me of all the things that drove me out of Iran um, in the year that I left, which was 1984. Um, and, and so Iran was among the Muslim nations that uh, were placed, uh, was placed on, on that uh, infamous ban. So I couldn't help but think to myself, if instead of 1985, I was trying to emigrate to the United States in, um, in 2016, I wouldn't get in. In fact, the program that sponsored me, which was based in uh, Vienna, Austria, had to shut down for all the duration of the four years that the ban was in place. And so that gave me my first panic. The second panic was when people started saying, um, including the former president, that perhaps we should only accept people who spoke fluent English. Well, <laughs> When, when I arrived at the age of 18, I spoke no English. Um, and I remember I was trying to, it, some boy uh, after two, three weeks that I was here, took me out to dinner and I was really trying very hard to impress him. And the waitress came um, and asked me if I wanted Coke or Pepsi. And, um, and I remember asking the waitress to, re to repeat the question. And by the third time I had to turn to my date and say, what is she saying? And then that was the end of my trying to impress him. Um, so, so, you know, this, this second um, point that, that kept being made about, you know, English, you know, they have to speak fluent English as if uh, language is something static that, that begins in some place and has an end and, and it isn't something organic that, that we can develop over time. 
um, it seemed very frightening to me also. And then the third was that people uh, who have wealth or special skills um, are the ones who should be first and foremost considered. Well, I, I came with a backpack and so did my mom and dad. And, um, and we, we had fled and we came with nothing. And so, and I was just uh, a, a high school graduate. So I had no skills to speak of and, and really no wealth. And, and so these things started to make me feel that having become who I have become um, has been a journey. And that this journey is, is not only important um, because it's part of my own biography, and it isn't just a story that could matter to my own children, but it is a journey that so many of us as Americans um, undergo, um, either if by, by virtue of being refugees or immigrants, or, or by, by virtue of being neighbors or, you know, um, um, or simply uh, fellow citizens in, in whatever towns or cities uh, we live in. And so I thought uh, there has to be a way that I can uh, bring all the readers, all the audiences who are hearing um, all these threatening talk about immigrants and immigration uh, should hear of. And so I had to, I had to kind of um, think about how I wanted to say this, right? Um, there were, there, the more I read um, works that were being published by journalists who were defending immigrants or those who were attacking immigrants on either side, whether they were politicians, journalists, writers, the more I realized that we were all locked in, in, in a battle and those who were pro-immigrants and immigration uh, were saying the same thing to, to the people who already were sympathetic and so was uh, the same thing was true about the, um, the other you know, uh, opposite side. So I decided that I wanted to do neither. I didn't want to uh, be a defender or a detractor um, and that as someone who has had this experience was undergone every stage of passage, um, arrival, um, assimilation, even though it's, it's a, a word that we try to stay away from these days, uh, resettlement and naturalization, uh, I thought the greatest contribution that I could possibly make is to bring everybody as close as possible to the visceral experiences of the refugee or the immigrant. And I thought if I can make the audiences feel what the immigrant feels upon landing or arriving in whatever way they land or arrive, if I can bring the readers to hear the inner thoughts of the immigrant, if I can make the feelings of grief and loss that most immigrants are overwhelmed by when they first arrive, then maybe, just maybe, I have made the immigrant accessible and knowable to the people who are being told that they should be afraid of the immigrant. In other words, I thought the best I could possibly do was to make the immigrant human and restore a sense of humanity as opposed to uh, a simply you know, journalistic headline um, to the immigrants so that um, we see them as who they are, we see us as who we are, um, which is your fellow human beings. Um, so um, I thought, how could I do this? If I, if I write in the first person, uh, then it will be probably dismissed as the account of only one person. In fact, if you go to the Amazon page of my most recent book, A Beginner's Guide to America for the Immigrant and the Curious, um, you will see that some people have said, oh, this is the account of someone who always had riches and, and uh, could easily uh, use her connections upon arrival and become uh, the person that she has become. And I read that comment and thought, hmm, <laughs> and how did you come to that conclusion? Because it was really interesting uh, to, to see how, you know, various readers just, you know, immediately 
uh, decide who you must have been or where you must have come from or with what resources. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I just didn't want to write uh, in the first person to be dismissed as, as uh, just a personal account or, you know, some unusual, uh, unusual human being who had, you know, exceptional uh, capacities or resources. I also didn't want to write in the third person because I didn't want the book to appear as just another uh, piece of reportage or journalism. I wanted people to, again, come as close to my account as possible. So um, I did neither the first person, which would have been a memoir, uh, nor the third person, which would have been a reportage. I chose the second person address. So when you pick up the book, um, it's, it reads like a cookbook. It talks to you. The book gives you guidance. Um, so I thought, you know, this way, uh, you directly uh, will be addressed. And there is no way that you can get out of this because I am talking directly to you. I am telling you, um, you know, what you will see when you arrive in America. And then, you know, initially, uh, when when the book was called A Beginner's Guide to America for the Immigrant, people said, you know, my editor especially said, but this isn't just for the immigrant. Um, it's also for uh, non-immigrant Americans who um, are being given access to the immigrant experience and are being invited to look at America through the perspective of the immigrant. Because after all, the immigrant seeing America and everything else about America for the first time has insights and views and perspectives to offer that the rest of us, the rest of you who've been born and raised here, might not be able to see. So we decided to add, and the curious, to the title of the book, the curious being, hopefully, all the native-born Americans who, um, who want to get to know the immigrant. So um, over lunch, I was told that many people uh, can't imagine what it is that uh, drives people out of their own countries. And uh, so this is me. Um, I wanted to show you what some of these reasons may be. This is me uh, in our courtyard in Tehran, in Iran, when I was eight or nine. Uh, my name obviously is not Leila, but my brother had come to the United States to study uh, in, that, in the late 70s. And um, I think it, it, he was in New York, and I think it was the year when a lot of people were printing their own names on their t-shirts. And uh, he had always wanted me to be the fantasy sister of his favorite sitcom. Uh, and the fantasy sister from the favorite sitcom was called Leila. And um, so he brought me that t-shirt and, um, and I was very proud of it because it was my very first American uh, piece of garment that I had ever had. And this is, um, and it, of course, I always look at the t-shirt which came from America and the skirt which uh, was a product of, uh, of a uh, Turkish neighbor who didn't speak a word of Persian. So we only went to her and you know, kind of uh, pointed to whatever it was that we wanted. And based on uh, whatever fabric she had extra of, uh, she, made, she made stuff for us. So um, that skirt uh, I was very fond of. Um, this is, I don't know how well you can see this. I'm, I'm the kid in front with, uh, with her hands on, on her waist. This is a scene from my uh, school in fifth grade. As you can see, there are boys and girls and, and we are all, you know, mixed together and relatively normal looking um, with our, you know, gray uniforms and blue shirts underneath, which, uh, could be anywhere, right? Um, any, any, any elementary school in any country. And then came 1979 to Iran, which um, upended uh, everything that we ever knew about Iran as a country, uh, the political system, our lifestyles, uh, the way we walked on the streets from, from the most uh, routine aspects of life, um, uh, to the most serious, uh, most 
fundamental aspects of life which had to do with um, you know, our political order. And after 1979, um, this is what my high school looked like. Uh, women were no longer allowed to uh, dress as they wished. Um, I am uh, the fourth person standing from from the top. There's a there's a very tall person, um, and then there's someone uh, laughing her head off uh, next to her, and and the person who's laughing her head off is me. Um, and and at this point, uh, we were. Uh, mandated to dress in in this dress code, which is, um, you know, the scarf, the long uniform, uh, the colors were even determined by by the government, the authorities, and and of course, once we started looking the way we did, um, all sorts of uh, opportunities for women uh, were also uh, pr um, prescribed. So women uh, were banned from certain uh, activities including singing in public, uh, you know, dancing or participating in um, in uh, various academic, you know, certain academic fields, including you know certain areas in medicine. Uh, women could could no longer become judges. So um, life vastly changed. And finally, this is me. Um, this is my passport picture. Um, and. Uh, I remember taking this photo several times because a, a couple of the strands of my uh, hair had shown and uh, they had sent me back saying that unless all the hair had been tucked under the scarf, um, I would not be, uh, you know, I, it would not uh, be legally usable. Um, I just wanted to show you these few pictures um, only after I was told over lunch that it's difficult for um, some people to imagine why, um, why some of us may be inclined to leave. And my answer was, nobody ever wants to leave. Um, nobody ever wants to be, uh, to, to give up the right to return. Nobody ever wants to leave under forced circumstances. Nobody ever wants to leave because they're persecuted for um, who they are um, by the virtue of race, religion, nationality, or by economic uh, or other, you know, environmental forces that may make life where they are impossible. So I think um, one of the most important uh, issues that is so hard for so many non-immigrants to understand is that as great as the United States is, um, none of us wake up one morning and decide that Today is the day that I want to uproot myself, give up my home, um, cut off my ties with everyone and everything I know, and cross the ocean or the river or whatever borders to go to this other country where I've never been, know nobody, and don't speak the language of or the culture of. Um, and that's what I want to do today. <laughs> as far as I know, um, none of us. Uh, choose to do this unless we have to. So um, just so you can get a flavor uh, for how the book sounds and, and just so I can expand a little bit more on this particular point that I just made, I will read you a short passage. So it's the cookbook language. It's the second person uh, addressing the readers. Um, and so the reader has by now, uh, I mean, uh, the, the narrator, the, the, uh, who's obviously from the, from the fact that she or he, well, it's really she, but uh, the book doesn't reveal that because it's a guidebook. Uh, so the guide in this book is a naturalized citizen who's giving tips and, and advice to the immigrant. And so um, the immigrant is brand new in America. She or he has been here for only a few days and she gets asked a natural, the most quintessential question that we all ask, including me, from every immigrant we ever meet. And so this is how the guide is advising um, how the immigrant should handle or hear this question to begin with. Um, so you will be asked, where are you from? 
and there. You have, you have arrived at the most vexing four words of your early days in America. Your reaction to this will be, above all, one of alarm. Your immediate thought will be that your pleasant manners have failed. After all, he has found you out, knows that you're not from here. You take it to mean that you do not belong, and if you have a particularly gloomy nature, you worry that you can never belong. Even after years of being here and trying to fit in, your accent or something else about you will always give you away, and the question, with a minor variation, can still haunt you. Where are you really from? When you're new, as you are on that first morning of your, after your arrival, anxiety explains all things before reason does. But in time, you will see that there are as many interpretations for those four questions as there are words for snow for the Eskimo. Asking where you are from can often simply be a way of breaking the proverbial ice. You might say, I'm from Thailand, to which the person asking the question could, in turn, excitedly say, my housekeeper is Thai, or I love drunken noodles. You might not be fond of your national cuisine, but no matter. Where are you from is launched into the conversation only to further the introduction. Even the native born ask each other the same question just to get acquainted. Sometimes it might lead to a wistful memory. You are the spitting image of my cousin Maddie. May, his, may he rest in peace. Or if the person asking is a single man or woman in pursuit of love, the following can ensue. If everyone in your country looks like you, I know where I must go for my next vacation. Such lines are common at watering holes and nightclubs. However, an encounter with a freshly arrived immigrant can have a disarming effect, not unlike that of alcohol. In truth, and especially in those early days, where are you from is prone to cause more trouble than good. If you come from a communist or um, other anti-American stronghold, you worry that the person asking might be wondering about your allegiances. If you come from a country in the throes of civil strife, you fear that he might suspect that you have fought on the wrong side of the conflict. If you're from a nation with a record of fist pumping and sword brandishing in front of the television cameras, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, for example, sometimes he wishing to confirm the place of your origin might run his hand across his head, uh, across his neck to, to sign a beheading. That is when you realize that a meat cleaver is now shorthand for your ancient civilization. In the early days after your arrival, where are you from is above all, a reminder of your unpreparedness to speak of the past. You have yet to shape your story, what you saw, why you left, how you left, and what it took to get here. This narrative is your personal book of Genesis, the American volume, the one you will sooner or later pen in the mind, if not on the page. You must take your time to do it well, and to do it justice. In the midst of a dinner party, holding your wine glass just as your favorite Hollywood starlet holds hers, nodding your amiable nods, flashing the rehearsed smile of one whose lips are well accustomed to the contours of happiness, you cannot respond honestly to where are you from. Amid the soft sound of jazz, the sweet scent wafting from flickering candles, and the polite bustle of tuxedoed servers circulating bite-sized delicacies on silver trays, the mention of your overturned dinghy, or the weeks and months of marching to get away from your violence-ridden hometown, followed by waiting in a reeking disease-ridden camp, or the sirens signaling aerial bombings that drove you into the shelter is, well, 
anticlimactic. It is also unwise if you would like to see, perhaps for the first time, what promises a deliciously dim ambiance can hold. You must treat your story as a conductor often treats his orchestra, only drawing on a few instruments at a time, one tail here, another there, and in time, in good time, and with trust, perhaps you can employ the entire ensemble. When, uh, when to give the straight answer to where you're from is only half the dilemma. The other is the response that it often elicits from the person asking, which is likely to be, you must be delighted to be here. And though you are glad that you're here, at that moment, you do not want your odyssey simply summarized and punctuated with mere gladness. There's certainty and expectation that you ought to be glad and grateful irritate you. Your instant reaction is to be unglad and ungrateful. You're fully aware how horrid were the circumstances, the land you left behind, but it was the land on whose grounds you had learned to walk, under whose sun you had warmed. You can denigrate that land because you and it are, however bitterly, inseparable. Strangers cannot. If they do, they would denigrate you too. So that's a, that's a passage that I thought uh, makes the point that I was trying to make. So I want to be in conversation with you, so I, I want to wrap this up as, um, as quickly as I can. And, and I think um, the most important point that I want to make um, about the immigrant specifically, uh, in addition to everything else that I've said, is this. We keep thinking about immigrants as people who come to enrich our economic lives. They, you know, whether they're documented or even undocumented, they pay into our tax system and, and they, they help our economy. Um, in the countries of their origin, they, they send remittances and they help those economies. And so the global economy keeps turning. Um, they perform jobs that our own people don't want to perform. They take care of the, our elderly in nursing homes. Uh, they, they do the work that most Americans um, often are reluctant to do. Um, yes, those things are important. And, you know, they enrich our, you know, uh, Silicon Valley with some of the brightest uh, minds and serve in our hospitals in sometimes in underserved areas. They do, they do a lot um, for, um, you know, in, in terms of the various professions and that they perform. But I also want to bring your attention to one very important fact that I think most of you who've been born and raised here uh, might um, neglect or simply not be aware of. We are also the people who recognize the value of the American democracy in ways that you um, who have been born and raised here and, and expect things to be the way they are, uh, might not. And, and I think the immigrants' contribution to the health of the American democracy, as people who keep reminding all of us, all the rest of us, that not in every country in the world a woman can appear in public in exactly the way she chooses is, is a given right. Uh, in a society, and that we can readily forego or um, lose some of the most important, valuable uh, rights and virtues that our societies give us, that give us the um, current uh, society that with, with all of its shortcomings and failures uh, makes our lives pleasant and um, and as equal as um, we are experiencing, um, however that equality may be incomplete or imperfect. And so we are here to also remind you that this is something, this democracy, these, these fundamental values of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness doesn't exist everywhere. And we want to remind you that we all must guard and perpetuate them as often and as much as we can.
Thank you so much. I can ask myself questions if you don't want to ask questions. Okay, I think my mic's on now. Um, well, first of all, uh, kudos to the university again for a great presentation and a great speaker. This is exactly what I think what, the, what many of you as students really, if you, the value of having this type of information being shared by someone that is, 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 is impactful. So I hope you appreciate what the, your university really does in bringing this type of inspiring messages. I, I've, got, I've, I've got to ask the question. We're, you know, our Western civilization culture versus, you know, the other cultures that we're not that all that familiar with, even though we are all sons of immigrants one way or the other. But I'm still struck by what was the decision that made your family say, today we uproot and we come to this country. Uh, meaning, you know, you were, you're, you're talking about, you know, what this country brings, brought to your, to you, and to the values. But there are others that also go to other countries, Canada, or they may go to Australia, or they may go to Argentina for different reasons. So how do you, how does someone in their family, you know, obviously you didn't, did you have a choice or did your parents have a choice? How did, how did that come about, that experience? Um, so, again, I was watching, you know, the fall of Kabul uh, a couple of months ago on TV, and, um, and everything about it reminded me of, of Iran in 1979. So if you're a woman, um, for instance, and, and you have had the choice to appear as you do, uh, suddenly being told that this is your uniform and this is what you um, can do. Um, you know, it, the term choice in this country is, is heard more than any other term uh, probably in our political debates. So, so we all understand how choice really truly matters. So imagine um, you wake up one day and, and you're told uh, how you're supposed to look. Um, you're told you know, uh, what the length of your sleeve needs to be, what the length of your hair needs to be, whether you can or cannot shave, whether you can put nail polish on your nails or not. And, and, and it seems, as I say it, that it's a superficial thing that you're being asked. So, you know, and, and in fact, for a long time, uh, or at least initially, um, we did say, oh, so, you know, what is it? Just throw the, th you know, the thing on your head and go out with the scar for a while and, and see how it goes. And, and I think because we didn't want to leave, uh, I did say that. That was sort of the narrative. But the thing is that the scarf that you're said to put on your head comes with a whole other host of other things that you're forced to do. Um, I... Um, was born and raised in a Jewish family. I was part of um, a Jewish community that was um, that predated uh, the arrival of Islam in Iran. So there were Jews in Iran before there were even Muslims in Iran. And suddenly, you know, um, uh, all religious minorities in Iran were told, um, you know, including the Jews to display signs in their stores that this business is being run by a non-Muslim. Now, when you think about it, why should it matter that, um, you know, they would require that you put up a sign saying that this business is being run by a non-Muslim? Well, because later they can identify special businesses and say uh, you shouldn't frequent you know, if, if you have a choice between two businesses or you, if you can eat at two different restaurants, uh, don't eat at the one that is not run by a non-Muslim because, uh, for instance, the justification uh, for non-Muslims, for non-Muslim uh, non restaurants was that they don't do the mandatory washing that Muslims perform every day as they pray, so they're not clean enough. So you should avoid buying food from them because 
the food is unsafe. So, so it came with all of these other um, possibilities that w suddenly began to disappear from life. You know, you, you couldn't count on the future because your opportunities of uh, growth, you know, whether it was academic or business or um, whatever, were, were dwindling. And add to that the fact that um, Iraq, which is a neighbor of Iran, attacked Iran in 1980, which was one year after that, you know, the 1979 revolution. And so everybody said, oh, you know, it's, a, it's just a skirmish on the border, it'll go away. Well, the first year passed, passed, it didn't go away. The second year passed, it still didn't go away. The third year passed, it still didn't go away. It, it is one of the least known wars of the last century because it lasted nine years and it uh, caused something close to one million people dead or maimed on both sides. Um, but because it was Iran and Iraq and you know the press wasn't just interested in in covering those two little countries that were going at each other. We didn't hear about it, but it was one of the, one of the most enduring uh, wars of the 20th century, the second half of the 20th century. And you know, the war, wars always come with shortages. So I remember we were standing in lines for everything you can imagine, from eggs and bread to you know, nylon stockings um, and other things. So, so it became, uh, at, I think um, initially we, we were all good sports, so I'll put on the scarf and I'll stand in line because we thought that all of these could be passing. But when they stopped appearing as though they could pass, that was when we decided to uproot ourselves. And even then, uh, I remember my mother and I uh, left Iran. That's a whole other story. It's, a, it's in my first book, if you're really curious. Uh, my mother and I left Iran, and uh, even then, uh, when we are finally arrived in Austria, I was still trying to figure out a way to return. I, I still thought, um, you know, people have to be loyal. You don't just up yourselves and leave when things get back. You uh, get bad. You you should go back and try to rebuild and help figure out a way to uh, fix whatever that had gone wrong. And and so it took it took several years for me to uh, to realize that. My returning wouldn't uh, wouldn't do any good. Thank you. So for the rest of the Q and A session, the way we're going to run it is um, we've got microphones with 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 the stu with, um, with with our student workers, and they if you're in the audience, you can raise your hand, and they will bring your, the microphones to you so you can ask the question. And we do need you to talk into the microphones so that the people um, on online can hear you. If you're online, we also encourage you to submit questions and. The way to submit questions online is to, um, is, is to type them into the question and answer box, and then um, uh, Ms. Hakakian can't see them, but I will read them to her so that, so that sure. she'll know, know what to answer. So, um, so, I, so, so are, there, are there any questions in the, in the hall quickly that we can start with, or shall we move on to online questions, which I already have several for? Um, so my question real quick is just, do you think does one like ever adapt to it to all this process or even like years after years after years you still have that like question of what if or what would have happened it still like haunts you so to speak um well i thought one adapts and and in some ways one forgets right but in 2016 um the former president reminded me that there are ways in which uh, i hadn't forgotten and that suddenly it, it um, I was panicking and it was completely irrational because I was thinking, you know, I'm a naturalized citizen. Nobody can throw me out, but I was afraid. I, I got afraid. And by the way, at some point he said, we should look back at some of those naturalizations that we have given to, to people from Muslim nations. And I thought, okay, okay, I, I need to do something. So, um, I think, I think there are some really fundamental experiences, and I think becoming a refugee uh, is one of them, or, uh, or 
leaving one's country without knowing whether you can ever return is one of those things. And it doesn't matter how long it lasts, because usually people ask me, how long were you a refugee in Europe? And I say, nine months. And they say, oh, you know, that's why you don't forget. I could have been a refugee for, you know, two weeks. Uh, the, the notion that um, you, I think the fundamental notion that you keep going over in your mind is the right to return has, has been taken away. And I think that's what uh, gnaws at you, uh, no matter how far you get from it, which is in part why um, we have such a beautiful literature about exile, right? You know, some of the greatest poetry out of Greece and so many other countries. Um, in fact, I commented uh, for the Metropolitan Opera in New York on, on a Verdi opera which is called Vapensiero. Um, and and the, my comment, it's, it's, uh, it's an aria from an opera uh, about the um, Jewish you know, uh, refugees who, um, after the fall of the temple uh, in Israel, were forced into, uh, out of their own country. And so uh, Verdi had written this opera. And, and so, so much. Uh, art and literature has been created uh, around this experience of being uh, driven out of a place where one uh, is born into and, and not being able to return. And I think that's, that's an experience that um, uh, marks you, um, not necessarily in a negative way. I don't mean to say the marking isn't always bad. You know, as we know, some actors with scars on their faces um, get get better jobs because they're they are looking for an actor with a scar. So, so I look at it that way. But but it is something that uh, that I think you uh, uh, will continue to live inside you. Um, and I think it, there are ways in which you can harness its value in a way that can be eventually useful as opposed to hurtful or, um, or detract from the quality of your life. Thank you. So uh, our first question online is from Perla Castillo, and she wants to know how hard, it was, how hard was it for you to learn English, and what do you think helped you learn it the most? Uh-huh. Um, so I remember... Um, <laughs> uh, for those of you who have, has anybody in this hall taken a TOEFL exam? Test of English as a foreign language? Oh, you have? You guys have? So um, after a couple of months, uh, after I arrived, uh, uh, somebody said, you have to register for a, an ESL course, English as a second language. And I said, I was a poet in my country. I don't need English as a second language. I do well with language. Uh, give me whatever it is that I'm supposed to do in order to enter college. So, you know, since I was so stubborn, they said, okay, go take your TOEFL. And uh, I remember going to, uh, I was the only one who's, who was taking that TOEFL exam. They gave me a tape recorder, something that most of you haven't, haven't seen because you have all these gadgets these days, but a tape recorder <laughs> was a machine that was on a, you know, that, that, you, uh, that you put a cassette into, another thing you guys haven't seen. And so uh, the cassettes uh, were sort of this big, you, you put them in the machine um, and you press the button and it played. And, and so that was the comprehension portion of my TOEFL exam. And, and I think, you know, and, and it would say, you know, Jack and Jill went uh, to have ice cream together, but Jill uh, only wanted non-fat ice cream, and the shop didn't have any non-fat ice cream, and so Jack and Jill had to uh, go to another town to have their favorite ice cream. And then there, there were four uh, answers, and I had to pick, you know, uh, who, you know, th the right answer. Did the shop, um, Jack and Jill, um, ate ice cream, Jack and Jill, didn't eat ice cream. So, you know, it was that. And I was listening to it. I had no idea what it said. Uh, in fact, one of the things that still 
astounds me is that um, for the first many months that I was here, uh, I couldn't identify English sentences. I heard spaghetti. Everything was connected. Nothing, I couldn't tell where the sentence began or where it ended. It just came as a long string of things, which is to answer the question. Um, by the way, I kept turning up the tape recorder during the TOEFL exam um, because I thought maybe it was because the sound was low. And if I turn it higher, I will get, understand it better. And then um, I played it again on a higher volume. I still didn't understand it. And finally, somebody from the other office came and said, the building is shaking. <laughs> I think you, you just want to give this up, and I did. But, but to answer the, the, um, the person who's asking the question, um, I think uh, you'd be surprised that <laughs> one of the things that, that really helped me uh, was watching soap operas. Um, because I realized that soap operas aren't fast, and the same thing happens all the time. Uh, and, and sometimes they're, oh, they're, they tend to be sick in the ICU rooms, you know, so nothing happens. So somebody comes and says, oh, my God. And, and those things I could understand. Uh, news I couldn't understand because I couldn't tell, you know, where, where it began or where it stopped. And it was fast. But soap operas were great because they would kiss and then somebody say, would say, I love you. And they would stare at each other. And, and it sort of gave me time. Um, but in addition, I, I mean, uh, to be a little <laughs> more serious, I, I tape recorded, or I just recorded uh, every lecture that I attended. And uh, so I, when I came home at night, uh, my job wasn't just to do homework. My job was basically to sit with my brother or whoever else was around and transcribe the entire lecture and then translate um, the entire lecture. And I did that enough uh, that by the end of the first semester, um, I, I was able to get somewhere. But, but it wasn't easy. Thank you. If there's any questions in the audience, please raise your hand and the students will bring you the microphone. And in the meantime, I'll go on to the next question, which nope. is, of all the countries to choose from, why is it the, that the United States seems to get so many immigrants, especially since there's a... I, uh, to, to paraphrase the, the question, since a lot of people don't like the United States, in, in a lot of other countries don't seem to like the United States. That's right. That's right. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think we're all hypocrites. You know, I think... Uh, so I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a really funny story because I'm, I'm just about wrapping up uh, a documentary uh, for, for HBO um, with a team of people. And... And the documentary is about the, um, a, a diplomatic crisis, which has come to be known as the uh, Iran ho uh, hostage crisis uh, took, that took place in 1979. I'm one of the producers on the show, and we have been looking at these old footages from, from the time that um, a few Iranian revolutionaries uh, climbed the walls of the American embassy in Tehran in November of 1979 and took 52 American hostages, uh, uh, American diplomats hostage. And this was the greatest embarrassment the United States had undergone um, since Vietnam. That, that suddenly, you know, the American embassy had not only been taken over, but, you know, uh, American diplomats had been blindfolded and, and handcuffed, and they were being paraded in front of world cameras. It just looked horrible. And so we, for this documentary, we interviewed uh, some of the former hostages. Um, and one of them said, uh, toward the end of his captivity, uh, the guy who had been his prison guard comes over to him and says, Psst, I have news. We're going to let you guys go. Aren't you excited? And so the former hostage says, I guess so. You know, he, he really doesn't believe anything they tell him. And he you know, treats everything with a great deal of suspicion. And he says, I'm telling you, you have to believe me. They're going to release you. Um, and remember, I gave you the news. And so the hostage 
or the former diplomat says, okay, thank you, um, you gave me the news, I'm glad that we're gonna be released. And then the captor, the prison guard says, if I come to the embassy where you will work next time, can you please process my visa quickly? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and it was really, really amazing to think that this guy who has taken this guy hostage for all these months and has been, you know, chanting death to America in front of the world cameras still wants a visa to get here. So to answer the question, I don't know why uh, the rest of the world uh, keep saying that they hate us when they clearly, uh, even the ones who actively hate us, want to get here. But the reason my family uh, chose to come here was because my brothers had come here in the late 70s to go to university, and they could no longer return to Iran because they would have been, uh, you know, conscripted into the Iran-Iraq War. They were of the age that they had to serve in the military. And so since they couldn't come back, we had to, you know, we decided that we, we would be reunified with them and that's why we came. Excellent, so um, maybe take some questions from the audience now. Hi, thank you for, uh, for being here. And, and the last question made me think of this, which is, you know, I like your approach of kind of having a conversation. And I'm, something I've been wondering is, how do we talk to those who might not appreciate maybe American history in a way? in that kind of a long history of interventions that maybe our government did that we don't quite totally agree with, how would you bring that up, right? Because in a lot of cases, they were very anti-democratic. Yeah. Um, but I think also we don't like to hear that or, or know about that history. So how would you kind of broach that conversation? Um, incidentally, um, because of this documentary and because of other uh, work that I do and other writing, uh, I get that question a lot, and, and, and it's, a, it's something that I have to really intellectually wrestle with a great deal. So this United States that is supposed to be one of the greatest bastions of democracy, or if not the birthplace of democracy, has also gone into Latin America in the 60s and the 70s, not to mention Vietnam or Cambodia, and done a lot of bad things, overthrown you know, popular leaders, installed dictators, and that's the legacy of um, the bitter part of the legacy of the US foreign policy. True, we've done that. Um, so um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, especially as someone who uh, has to watch Kabul and be reminded of um, Iran, which is in the same way 43 years later, um, this is how I see it. We have two choices. We can withdraw and say, uh, we have a bad history, we've done a lot of wrong interventions, we need to stop and, and withdraw from the world and not engage, which is what Donald Trump wanted to do, which is clearly what Joe Biden has decided to do with the decision he made vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. What I think we should do is this, if we leave the scene, who will fill the empty space? China, Russia, Iran? Do we want, because the Taliban had long been talking to the Chinese in, in, the, in the months preceding the fall of Kabul and, and had, by the way, promised the Chinese that um, they, will not, um, they will not make a fuss about the Chinese oppressing the Muslim minority in China. So you would think the Taliban, as the champions of Islam in Afghanistan, would press China uh, to release the Uyghurs, the, the Chinese minority, or take them out of the concentration camps where they're languishing at the moment. Uh, but the first deal they made um, in order to benefit from China's uh, uh, business benefits was to say, we will do or say nothing about the Uyghurs. So my point being, 
if we leave the scene, these are the alternatives. And, and the world will just deteriorate further and further into the hands of tyrants. We can sulk and say, we've made mistakes. Let's just you know, look at our record from the 60s and the 70s or you know, whatever else that came up before or after. Or we can say, is there a way that we can learn the proper lessons from those interventions and come up with interventions where we continue to play an important part in this world without messing things up. And I want the answer to be the latter. And I think, by the way, if we don't choose this, we give up the one and only way in which we can exert a sense of um, um, specialness, I don't want to say supremacy, but, but the only way in which we can continue to be exceptional is by doing the right thing in the world, by leading the world in, in governance, in, in democratic values, and that's the only thing that's left to us. Because in so many other ways, the non-democratic countries like China ha um, have overtaken us in business, in cyberspace, in real space, and those things we can't boast of anymore. They have caught up with us. And I think the only space that's left, the only space that we can potentially fill is by being the leader in the world in perpetuating uh, the values of free speech, um, equality, um, gender equality, uh, religious equality, and, and all those other areas. Hello. Hi. Okay, as many of us here, um, our parents are immigrants um, from Mexico. Give them my best. <laughs> and I just wanted to ask, like, going back to the language question, if for you it was difficult, how bad or how difficult was for them to understand and learn a new language? And like the support like in the family, like how was it? Terrible. My father, who was a school principal in Iran, and a poet, by the way, um, came to America and, and refused to learn. In fact, it's very funny, my father was forced to go to English as a second language classes, and every night he came home, his, um, his notebooks were filled with poetry about how difficult English was. So, so one of them, which I still remember, uh, I'll, I'll sing it to you and I will uh, translate, with the, uh, 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 translate it for you. It was, did, does, and do, mara bichare kar? He, he couldn't understand the conjugation of did, does, or do. So the, the poem, the line says, did, does, and do, did me in. I, I curse the person who forced me out of my country. So that was my father's attitude. My mother, on the other hand, decided that she was going to get so aggressive to compensate for my father. So it was very difficult to leave the house with my mother on the street because she was embarrassing. She would go up to the strangers and say, hello, <laughs> my name is Helen, who are you? And so she would strike up a conversation with anybody and anything that walked on the street. And she did it so much that she actually became very independent and she was able to, I mean, she wouldn't be able to, you know, attend university, but she, she was able to um, go grocery shopping. I just think that, first of all, we should take the emphasis off language. I wrote a piece which uh, Amy, who, who's not here. Oh, who is here? Hello, Amy. Um, I, I, I wrote a piece uh, that ran on the anniversary of 9-11 in, in the Los Angeles Times. And it was a piece about my dad, because on 9-11, uh, my father, 
who had written all this poetry about how he hates to be here, how difficult English is, um, suddenly did something I had never expected. Uh, we, were, we were watching, you know, they, my parents lived uh, in Queens, New York, um, and they happened to have uh, a little bit of a view of downtown New York City where the towers had been uh, attacked and you could see smoke rising in the horizon if you stood on the balcony uh, in their apartment. And, and so I stood there and my father disappeared. He went out, he came back, and he came back with an American flag. And he hung the American flag on the railings of the balcony. Now my father doesn't speak English, and my father has never in his life held any other flag ever, you know. And he hung the flag. And, and my piece is about trying to figure out why would my father do that, number one? How did he know to do that? I mean, it, it's not like, you know, you see your country is attacked, you immediately know to go buy a flag. How did he know? I mean, I, I was really curious. And the third thing is, how did I always misunderstood my dad? Because I always thought that he hated being here. And then suddenly when he hung the flag, I realized that he says all those things. But when push comes to shove, and he needs to actually, at, at a moment of crisis, express his allegiance, he's an American. And I thought that I discovered it just as much as he did on that day. And that's basically my piece. I just think that language isn't all that important. That language shouldn't be a measure of whether somebody um, belongs or doesn't belong to America. But I tell you what should be. Whether somebody believes that men and women are equal. Whether somebody believes that it doesn't matter whether you're Catholic or Jewish or Muslim. We're all equal before the law. If that person believes in that in any language, and lives, I don't care where they live in the world, they're Americans. And I think as long as this is how we think about it, how we begin to shift the emphasis from the things that aren't really, uh, don't really matter as much as we think, to the things that really matter, like what are your values, then we continue to repeat mistakes. Um, and I think language, you know, how people dress, um, these things aren't the most important things. They are important in the sense that they give you access to participate in the society. Um, they, they allow you to go to the movies together. But, um, and, and, you know, perhaps they allow you to um, do civic participation and so on. But beyond that, I, I don't think there is much more to it. So if your parents don't speak, Lay off. It's okay. Okay, I have a couple of questions from online now. A couple of people have asked variations of the, this question, which is, um, when or do you feel the United States feels like home to you, or do you still feel disconnected from the country? Or if, if you do, when did, when did you start feeling like it was home to you? Um, I think um, I... Probably for me, when I felt that, um, you know, as someone who has always wanted to be a writer, that I was um, capable of writing and not giving myself away as a, as a non-English speaker, that, that my mastery of the language was good enough to do what I had always wanted to do, uh, which was to write. But I think, ultimately, a sense of belonging um, to, to this country should come from whether you connect with the fundamental values of this culture or not. I think if you, um, if I came here and believed that, for instance, um, you know, I didn't like the fact that uh, women showed up in public without covering their hair, then it would be, you know, it would be hard to really be uh, an American or belong in this country because y y you clash, your values clash with this place. Fortunately, I found a way of, um, you know, I, 
I thought that I thought that I could embrace um, whatever it was that we, at least in principle, stand for. Thank you. My, uh, the, the, um, so I should say that was from um, Anna Vargas and from Jessica Gutierrez. So Great. to to give them credit, so I don't I don't get in trouble for plagiarizing <laughs> their questions. Um, the, the next question is from. Um, I should notice that a lot of people are thanking you for your presentation. So oh, they, they love you're it welcome. Online. Thank you. So it, it's easier to say that when they're when they're online. So from, <laughs> from Jackie Flores, um, she said that it was mentioned that you worked uh, with UNICEF for a film. Um, what was that? Ex what was that experience like? Um, the film aired on, uh, f by UNICEF. I I was officially with uh, the United Nations. So. Um, it was very interesting because the film was made for the Department of Children and Armed Conflict at the United Nations, and uh, they wanted to bring it, the world's attention to the cause of uh, underage children um, who were being recruited into various wars. And, and I have to tell you, the funniest thing that happened was that uh, when you have to deal with these, you know, uh, bureaucracies, uh, the very first thing that everybody wants to do is uh, they want you to interview them. So, you know, they, they give you uh, the permission and the budget to go make a documentary, but then they also get ready so that they, you put them on camera. And, and, and so they all lined up and said, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so so -and -so are all ready to be interviewed. And I said, then I shouldn't be your filmmaker. I'm not interested in you guys. I'm interested in the kids. I want to tell the story of the kids. And I'm sure you have a lot of really important things to say, but I prefer to speak to, go find a few people who have uh, had the experience of being uh, recruited to wars and um, and hear from them. So nobody liked it, but it was too late. We already had signed the contract, and I was it. And, and by the way, you know, speak, uh, speaking of immigrants and immigration, I found that we, you know, some of the immigrants who come to this country, to, to our country, are these children who have been, uh, who have not, not just witnessed wars, but they have been forced to fight in these wars. And they come with such a great deal of shame to the point that they would never be willing to admit to anybody that they've done this. So my job was particularly difficult because out of hundreds of people uh, whose name was given uh, to me, to as potential interviewees, I found only three people who were willing to talk. Three people um, who were willing to admit that they had fought in these wars. And I interviewed them. And one of them came out with a book, which became a runaway bestseller. And the other one was sitting in an immigration detention center. So his attorney had told him it was good for his case to talk to me. And the third one was a girl um, whom they had used as a, as a, as a sex slave. Um, so, and I kind of pieced this together uh, through a narrative um, that each of these uh, kids kind of told. Um, <laughs> and, the, and my documentary does not have a single UNICEF or United Nation bigwig in it. But it was still good and people liked it. Thank you. So let's take a, we've had a couple of questions from online now, so maybe if we can, if there's any questions from the audience, um, we can take some questions from the in-person audience, if there are. If not, we can go back to the online. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Um, so I was listening to you say that you wrote it in second person as a how to navigate America, correct? Um, yeah. So why did you write this book as a guide? Did you ever feel that the book might, miss, might be misinterpreted by some people and imposed as like a type of persuasion that for immigrants to come or to be incited to, be, to become American? Mm -hmm. um, the book, I mean, I don't think people need me to invite them. 
to come. They, they come because they, they want to or they have to. Um, but I think there's a way in which um, I, I, this is not the first time I'm getting this question. Um, I, I also deal with the question of the undocumented in the book a little bit. And, and so I was asked at a, at a different uh, event whether I was saying that it's okay for people to be undocumented or you know, um, enter this country uh, with a, you know, not going through the proper procedures. Uh, I'm certainly not doing any of that. Um, I just think that um, there, are, there are certain fundamental points that we need to understand that, um, uh, first and foremost, that, again, nobody wakes up one day and decides that they want to, you know, um, upend their lives, turn their lives upside down, and go somewhere else. No matter how bad their circumstances are, people are far more at ease being in the places where they're at ease. And I thought this is a really important, crucial point that we had to make um, to, to the non-immigrants. And, and the other fundamental point, I think, is that, uh, I mean, in addition to, to all the other things that I've said, that um, we are the ones, we who have been through these uh, uh, experiences, especially of non-democratic societies, we are the ones who renew the original American promise. We are the ones who uh, remind everybody else um, and, and in some ways uh, guide everybody else to know and recognize that keeping those fundamental values is the reason um, that we are who we are and we can live the way we live. Um, so the book is as much for immigrants as it is for the non-immigrants, who, who I refer to as the curious. I mean, I just thought that um, putting it in the, in the format of a guidebook uh, will, will be a disarming way of, of um, you know, having this difficult conversation. But it wasn't in any shape or form an invitation to anyone. No, go ahead. It's, uh, you can do what you well, well, thank you. Um, so one thing struck me that you mentioned uh, being the son of an immigrant myself, the description uh, from Poland, actually, but the description of the uh, that sort of feeling where one is uh, sometimes ashamed or frustrated with one's own home place, but then is also um, you know, reluctant to hear other people of having that opinion. Of course, that's also true for people born in the United States. Um, and I was wondering, uh, you know, especially in recent years and even in the highest levels of power, there are a lot of critiques at the most fundamental level uh, against the sort of American value system that, that you know, you're speaking about. And I was wondering, as an immigrant yourself and with these experiences, how you speak back to that kind of an increasing trend in our culture that I don't mean uh, criticisms of, you know, uh, American interventionism or anything like that, but I mean the uh, more recent attacks at the most fundamental level at these American value systems, the pursuit of happiness you spoke about and all of those, those ideas. Well, I mean the, the increasing sense in which the, the sort of founding documents of the country are being scrutinized and questioned and that's sort of um, okay, so I'm sure this is a very bad uh, example, but I'm going to use it anyway. What did the telephone look like when Alexander Graham Bell invented it? It was a chunky, big, boxy thing that had just one thing, and, and you lifted it, and you talked to it, and it went to some switchboard, if it did, um, and then, you know, other people who were sitting in some basement would route your call. It was unwieldy, it was huge, it was ugly, it crackled when you talked, um, it, you know, conversations ended every once in a while. It was just, you know, not good, but it was an invention, right? And it was the beginning of something. 
I think about the American democracy in the same way. I think a bunch of people played Alexander Graham Bell, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. They were imperfect. And it was something that didn't exist anywhere else in the world. You know, uh, nobody else until Washington had ever removed himself voluntarily from power. So that's a good thing. You can say Washington had slaves. That was not a good thing, right? Slavery wasn't a good thing. And, and you can criticize Washington for a lot of other things. But he was the person who, for the first time in history, did something that no other leader had ever done. And therefore, he gave us a pathway to something we have, we, the world has never known, and the world now knows is, is the best way we know so far uh, to run a country. As, as Churchill said, um, democracy is not, you know, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Churchill said in, a, in his far more eloquent and funny way that democracy is uh, not a very good way to run <clears throat> a country, except if you have tried every other way. So unless we can come up with something better than, than democracy, uh, this is so far the one that has proven to us to work the best. So did George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or whoever one of those guys uh, need to create something a lot better? Sure. I'm sure Alexander Graham Bell would have wanted to come up with the cell phone. But we needed, you know, what it took from whatever, you know, prototype that came out as a clunky, you know, satellite phone to get to what we have in our pockets today. Democracy is the same way. Um, you know, fundamental ideals of America are the same way. They, they didn't, they define their human being as white American male. Well, obviously I wouldn't have been happy with that. So let's expand the, the definition to, to include other people as we have done. So I think I would have a beef with the system if it had proven that it could not correct itself, but it has. Can it cr correct itself more? Sure. But, but at least we know that kicking and screaming, it gave the rights, the right to women to vote. Kicking and screaming, it gave the non-white races the right to vote, right? So, so as long as it can be forced into doing whatever it really didn't want to do, we can continue to celebrate the original idea and to do everything we can to make it better. And unless somebody else has a better idea, uh, I think we should stick with this. Okay, I think uh, we'll, 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 uh, I'll just give you one more question quickly and then we'll have to wrap up, unfortunately. I want to apologize to people who... I want to apologize to people online whose question I didn't ask. So, the final question is from um, Alicia Reyna, and she says, when arriving in a country you don't know and know some people do not accept you, can make undocumented people feel alone and get depressed. What do you think could be done to, um, related to them? To the okay. Well, uh, I, I actually do try to um, uh, deal with this uh, a bit in the book. I can't claim that I understand that experience because I know from um, having uh, helped, in fact, with a few people uh, who have been undocumented, who have, whose lives have um, come into contact with mine, that it is a, a, an experience beyond um, what I have known. So uh, I, I just want to say that I, I think it's far more difficult than, than I can imagine. However, <clears throat> First of all, you know, we should uh, stick to the rules and try to always encourage people to enter the country in, in ways that are, that honors the procedures that have been set up. <clears throat> 
However, if there are people already in the country who are undocumented, and by the way, every one of us, whether we are aware or not, myself included, use them all the time, uh, need to recognize that the reason we need to treat them right is only 50% for their sake. The reason we need to treat them right is 50% for our sake. Why? The moment we enter a relationship with a lesser person, the moment we say to ourselves that this person deserves only half of what they're valued, whether it's an hourly rate of the job they perform or an increased number of unreasonable hours of the, uh, that they have to perform at their job, the moment we enter into this relationship, we have allowed our country, we have allowed our system to go from a democratic system to a non-democratic system. And we don't want to be a non-democratic society because it makes us not American, because it undermines everything that this society is all about. The only advantage that we can boast of is that. So, so when you think about the undocumented and why the undocumented, whether they're the dreamers or their parents, uh, the people who've been in this country for years and years, whom we know have not committed crimes and who are working within our communities, why we need to become equals with them. First of all, because they are who they are and they are doing what they're doing for us. But secondly, because we don't want to live in a society that creates half humans. We know from the history, from uh, the treatment of women, African Americans, and other communities of race and color, that the moment we enter into such a social contract, we become un-American. And therefore, we want to avoid that. And therefore, we want to do our very best to um, never allow such a situation to exist. And so, um, my, my uh, message is to uh, legalize those who've been here um, whether they're dreamers or their parents, people who are already here, are performing tasks that are essential to our communities, have paid their taxes, um, have been good citizens in their communities, um, to, to bring them into the fold. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you. and uh, firstly, I want, I want to thank a few other people who have, who have helped us with this thing. I want to thank Amy Palacios, the, the, the Associate Director of the Center, for organizing all this. I want to thank all our excellent students who are helping us um, who, are, who are helping us with the questions and all the other things that they've been doing. I would like to thank um, Event Services for the work they put into doing this. And of course, I want to thank OIT, who have taken um, a challenging situation. And I hope this has been as smooth as I think it's, I think, I hope it's gone online as smoothly as, as I think it's gone. So thank you, thank you all. And of course, I want to thank IBC for their generous sponsorship of this, uh, of this event. And finally, I want to thank uh, Ms. Bucket Ina Kim for this excellent speech and giving us so much insight. I want to give her a little gift from um, Tammy Reed for all of the